Welcome to Being Humankind, with your hosts Brian, Mike, and Neely. We explore what it means to be human in a time of disconnection. If you could have lunch with anyone, who would it be? Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Yeah, Jordan Peterson. Um, I missed, yeah. I don't know if I need to expand on that, but. Um, if you want. I mean, I should have added the caveat that it could be an alive or dead person, but I mean. Uh, if it could be alive or dead, maybe Jung, but I don't think I can handle Jung. Like, I, I'm, I, I might be, I, I don't want to take the risk on Jung. I'm afraid I could be like, at the table thinking I made a great choice and then find out that he's just way over my head. Um, you know, Peterson decoded things for me that I saw in other places. You know, he, he created a fusion for me between the, the modern world that I felt was sort of just not quite telling me the truth and the the mythological which i also felt was not quite telling me the truth and he kind of put them together in a way where when now i look at either one and i can see some truth in it um it's, it's a shame he's he's unwell at this point but I, yeah he would still be that's the first name that popped into my head and i, I can't imagine that What would you talk to him about? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think I would, I would want to talk to him about religious symbolism and its relationship to, to the human condition. Um, I think I would want to talk to him about the the current state of the world and. The division that's in it, and 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 ask. I mean, I would want to engage, right? So I would want. I, I have this feeling, and I, you know, maybe it's not accurate that if I spoke to him, it would be a free flowing conversation, and that it would grow on itself. Um, but he's someone where, when he spoke, when I when I've heard him speak, he he said things that. I felt like I wanted to say, but hadn't gotten to quite yet. Um, and I've listened to so much of you know his lectures and stuff. And at some point, it gets, you know, there's a, there's a lot of repetition, which actually I found useful. But I want to pull. I would like to take the opportunity to pull him out of that repetition to like you know to start you know casting lines out and saying like, but but what what about this you know. Um, Yeah, I, I just love to see where that conversation went. I, I mean, he's someone who, like I said, Jung, I don't know well enough to know if I could hang with. I feel like Peterson could get me what I wanted from Jung, but I could hang and keep the conversation in a place where I could where I could participate. So, you know, and, and also responsibility. You know, he was he's really big on personal responsibility and and what that means. Um, he's really big on the the lessons of religious mythologies, which I think are more important than, and he seems to sort of like just move right past things that are dogmatic. And, and he points at this thing. So, so my background, like I said, was in anthropology, but one of the things in that, I was really, really into Darwin. And uh, Darwin, what Peterson points out, I don't think he ever actually said it, but what he, what he points out is this idea that if religion evolved in all these societies throughout the world, independently, and, and pretty much every society has at some point been based on it, then it must serve an evolutionary purpose. And, and if that's the case, how do we just let it go? You know, 
you don't necessarily, you know, it may change or evolve, but without these, and I, I use the term mythology because I talk to a lot of people who are atheists. Um, and I think there's something there that there's something there that that people on both the left, both the left and the right are missing. There's a unifying thing in the mythological structures themselves, right? We got a psychologist in the room, so I gotta be really careful not to overstep my bounds when I say some of this stuff. But the, the impression I have is that your, so what your, your left brain is the verbal side, right? And your right brain actually is more likely to change behaviors because it thinks more symbolically and through narrative and story and things like that. And I feel like Peterson keeps pointing at this saying, this is, this is the key to keeping society together. We need to tell the right stories and we need to center our society around the right stories. I don't care what the stories are. Like, I, I don't care if it's this person's religion or that person's religion, I think we miss the big picture, which is at the center of a society must be a common story. And that story is going to affect the behavior of everybody in that society and dictate how everybody gets along. And what I would really like to do is have that conversation with him and just be like, well, well, how do we, how do we do that? Because everybody thinks most people in modern times are going, well, you know, they're just stories, like just stories. No, like that, they're the only, in my opinion, those stories are the only thing that can hold a society together. And Peterson seems to understand way more about that than I do. And so I, I just want, I want to go down that rabbit hole. I want to go way down that rabbit hole. And yeah, so Peterson. So it's almost that's like that's fascinating so it's almost like <clears throat> taking people who are atheists and who people who are religious and like you said left right in whatever fashion and saying you, you we can all there's room for everybody because we are we all have a common story and we all need, we have a story, we have a purpose. I mean, I, so my degree, my undergraduate, undergraduate degree was in historical archeology. span So a lot of the, what I studied was anthropology. And I, so I kind of, I kind of a similar background. It, it's a little kind of similar. So um, just like a lot about society and people having to kind of um, make up stories you know, to really kind of understand what was going on around them. And I get, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I was, I want you to finish before I go because I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say instead of listening, so. No, well, no, so I, I do that, I do that too. Um, so, but people having to make up stories to really understand what was going on around them. And so that was, um, you know, here and like, so that must be where religion came from. And, you know, you hear, you just hear it from all these different um, cultures. And it just, I just, I don't know, I, I'm having trouble kind of getting out what I really want to say, but what, what, the way you said it, summed it up just perfectly. So I, I think that the, 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 the key piece that everyone's missing is that okay, they were making up stories to figure out what was going on around them, but maybe they were better at it than the way we're doing it, right? So I'm thinking about this from an anthropological point of view where you have, you have a verbal tradition in which you actually, verbal traditions will remove the unnecessary point, parts of stories more than they'll add to stories. They get more and more and more concise over time in a, in a verbal tradition uh, or an oral tradition, right? So what I'm saying and, and what I think, I, I don't know how much of this I'm copying 
from Peterson because it's been a long time since I listened to him, but I listened to a lot of him before. I... What it seems is that the there are facts that we can get to or facts about behavior that we can get to only through extremely long periods of time with many people's brains working together at the same time and that we can't articulate them in a straightforward empirical manner. And that seems to be, to me, the thing that's missing in 2021. Nobody seems to understand that there are things we can communicate to each other that are maybe the key issues that we can't communicate in a straightforward empirical manner. And that's not to say that empiricism and science are not incredibly important. There's this, this crazy idea that you get, especially in political division between the left and the right, where it's like, well, there's science or there's dogma. And it's sort of like, well, hold on, how about some, there has to be a scientific explanation for how religious mythologies evolved. And if we really take Darwin seriously, then, then we have to say this, they have some huge Darwinian value. And so in my opinion, you can't be a true Darwinian. And I, I, I definitely, this is very heavily based on Peterson. So I don't wanna make it say in my opinion as though I didn't steal some of this from him. Um, but you can't be truly following, you can't be truly understanding Darwinian evolution in a social way, social evolution, without understanding that these mythologies evolved for a purpose and that their value is huge, huge. And so this, this idea that Darwin and religion are against each other, to me, it's the exact opposite. Like the biggest, the biggest evidence to me that religion has value is Darwinism. Like it's, it's the argument for why religion's important, but because we've been pitted against each other, everyone's just sort of like missing that fact. That's why I wanna to talk to Peterson because I think he could say that better. <laughs> and then tell me why I'm, tell me what's wrong with it and then tell me where the pivot point is, right? Cause that's where you actually make development, right? You, you go towards something and you find out you're like almost pointing at it. And then you go, and then you go, no, 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 it's just that it's 10 degrees to the left and try saying these other things and see if that's right. And, and that's, that's what those oral traditions do, right? They just, they pivot slightly. They just, they, over years, the story changes and the stuff that's not wisdom gets dropped. And maybe something gets added back in that's not wise. And then that piece that got added back in will get dropped, just like evolution, just like Darwin, right? If the gene gets in and that gene is not useful for, for the population, the gene gets dropped. And that's what oral traditions do. And it's thousands of brains over thousands of years. It's, it's the giant, it's, it's one, in some ways, it's one giant beautiful brain that is solving society's problems. And we go, no, it's just a story. No, it's not just a story. Do you think that in some ways that might have to do with uh, an overly literal point of view in that, to your point, it's thousands of people over thousands of years and we try to simplify into that, into the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, they believed this when in, in reality, there is no like mono, monolithic culture that it's an expression over time and and geography right i think oversimplifying things is is part of the problem right and and oversimplifying things the problem it starts with the assumption that i can understand easily what they were thinking um and no one's really willing to put the effort in to try to see another way of functioning. I mean, I think one of the big problems is we, science has given us so much material success in, in super important ways, right? I mean, we have like, 
eradicating hunger and diseases and like you know the average person in the united states right now is living better than a king did a few hundred years ago you know this is but because it's given us so much measurable success we just sort of hyper focused on it and forgot and and we don't I, I always look at the the New Year's re, uh, the New Year's resolution as an example. I, I'll, in some of my my talks, I'll I'll do that. And you, you do a New Year's resolution, and you say, um, "Tomorrow, I'm going to start going to the gym and eating healthy." And you don't do it, and you know you're not going to do it. But the reason you don't, don't do it, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but it seems to me the reason you don't do it is because the part of your brain that's verbal that's saying, I'm going to do this, is not the part that controls your behavior. The part that controls your behavior is the one that heard the story. And it's modeled, it's, it's evolved from watching others, right? You can, so you watch others, you observe their behavior, you mimic that behavior, you watch and you, you generally watch others who you think are successful, right? They're doing this better than me, I'm going to watch them. Then you mimic that behavior. If it works for you, then you incorporate that behavior. Right, and then and then you, you you move in that direction. That the the narrative, the story, the mythological structure is a story that if that as you tell yourself a story, you're imagining that you're watching that successful person who does things properly. You are then incorporating that thing that you imagined and seeing if it works, and then it works. So the, the, they're super powerful in that regard. That's not how we think we should control behavior in 2021, our own behavior or society's behavior in general. We think in this sort of empirical scientific way, which has nothing to do with human behavior, we go, I am going to go to the gym on January 2nd and start going every day and change my eating habits. Because if I wrote this down in a scientific paper, then that would be the proper way. This, this part of the brain is, is completely in control. This part of the brain is completely shut off in 2021 it's not being fed there's no food coming in to to the symbolic part of the brain and that's the part of the brain that controls your behavior on a huge level throughout all of society so if if we're not feeding the part of the brain that feed that that controls the behavior of the individual and of society at large we're doomed to crash and, and we just go, well, science gave us penicillin, and that's great. Let me use that same empirical thought process, this side of the brain. Let me go use this to change my behavior. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. That, I mean, that's, why, that's why the Masonic fraternity has been incredible for me, because it's it teaches through symbolism. And when I, I was listening to Peterson when I joined the fraternity, and... I, no, sorry. I started listening to Peterson right after I joined the fraternity. And I went, oh, he's telling me, and I don't, that's another question I'd love, I'd love to know. Is he a Mason? Because he's telling me exactly how to interpret the Masonic ritual and exactly how to say, oh, okay, these are symbols. They are here to unlock behaviors in me. I don't have to understand it and be able to write a paper about it. Don't get me wrong, I keep getting caught up in this idea like, ooh, I'm gonna write a paper about this. But that's not how it works. It's it's that it's that storytelling part of the brain that it works on, and that's why it works. And we miss it. And there's no there's no other place I've found that is doing that. And I'm sure there there are other places. So there's gotta be. I just, I want all the religious leaders to just do a slight pivot. You know, I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't care which religious group you're part of. I just want them all to do a slight pivot and go, oh, this is the purpose of me teaching these stories. Because I want, I want to help people change their own behavior. And that would be, you know, that that's, that's what needs to happen. 